mission that we'll be launching at the end of this decade, probably 2028 or 2029. It was just selected as part of the Explorers program. Uh, and the goal of this mission is to launch not one, not a few, but nine spacecraft to study the nature of turbulence in space plasmas. Um, I'm going to uh, hopefully motivate why this is an interesting question, and then also talk through the actual technical, how we're going to do this and explain that nice little uh, diagram that's happening in the lower right-hand corner. Give me one second. Certainly. Um, so, uh, but before I do, I wanted to note that uh, this is a, a work of many people. Uh, I'm the deputy principal investigator for this mission. Uh, the PI is Harlan Spence, and he's at the University of New Hampshire. And we've had a whole collaboration of engineers and scientists from across uh, a number of different organizations. Uh, Ames Research Center, Northrop Grumman, and Blue Canyon Technologies are actually making the, the spacecraft. And then we have a number of domestic and international partners uh, that are making all of the different uh, instruments themselves. So let's go ahead and, and motivate what it is we're going to be measuring uh, and why. So you're probably all familiar with this particular image, right? We are collecting photons that are coming to us from 27,000 light years away. It gives us a lot of tremendous information about the accretion disk that's around Sagittarius A star, but it's all dependent on understanding how those photons are emitted, how hot this ionized gas, this plasma is, how hot the electrons and the protons are, and what happened to them in between when they were emitted and when they got to us right here. That's a lot of assumptions that have to be modeled in and understood. And we want to understand the, the basic physical processes that are actually happening in that accretion disk. We're not going to be able to actually send a spacecraft to that disk and actually measure the local electrons and protons. That's just not something feasible to do in something that's 27,000 uh, light years distant. We're also not going to be able to get to a lot of these fascinating uh, uh, stellar nebulae, right? This is a mere 7,000 light years distance, uh, a recent image taken by the James Webb Space Telescope. There's a lot of incredible information about how stars are being born, how planets are being formed in those disks that we can collect from those photons, but there are certain fundamental physical processes that do require us to get a, a, a grip on the actual uh, ions and the electrons that are moving around, the electric and magnetic fields that they're generating. And so what we really want is something that's a bit closer by, a nearby astrophysical uh, source, and we just thankfully happen to live around one, right? Our sun, a mere eight, eight and a half light minutes away from us. This is a lot closer. This is an object that we can actually send a spacecraft to, to locally measure the conditions of, of the actual plasma. Now, actually landing on the sun, that's not something that's feasible to do engineering-wise. We can't actually put a spacecraft there, but the sun, thankfully, uh, extends part of itself out to us in something that's known as the solar wind. Now, this nearby astrophysical system, this expansion of the, uh, of the sun's atmosphere, was originally predicted by Eugene Parker back in the late 1950s. He basically sat down and was able to show that the sun is sufficiently hot, that that thermal pressure that actually pushes the sun's atmosphere away is too strong to be completely constrained by the gravitational pull that tries to hold the atmosphere in which means that you're not going to have just a static atmosphere that will sit there and be contained, but rather you're going to have something that is going to be expanding further outwards and actually filling up the entire solar system, the, the bubble of what we refer to as our heliosphere. Uh, I promised myself not to show too many equations because otherwise eyes I know will glaze over, but effectively he solved a set of differential equations that uh, gave us the this physical solution, this line five right here. Um, and if I turn this into a laser pointer, hopefully you all can see that. This line five right here, uh, the x-axis here is the distance away from the sun's surface. The y-axis uh, is how fast the solar wind is actually blowing. And what he showed is that you get an acceleration of the solar wind from it being not moving at all to actually becoming supersonic. Uh, the, the velocity here is normalized 
by the local sound speed. And so you get this faster and faster solar wind that blows out from the sun's surface. And as I said, fills our entire solar system which means if we want to actually measure these plasmas, we don't need to go to the sun's surface. They just naturally fill the entire solar wind. And well, we can send some spacecraft out there to actually make those measurements. And that's what we have done and are currently doing. Uh, the first two measurements that were made of the solar wind uh, were made back in the uh, early 60s. Uh, for those of you who recall why there were two distinct first, uh, first measurements of this, well, uh, there was both a measurement by the Soviets with their Luna spacecraft, as well as uh, the United States uh, measuring it with the Mariner 2 spacecraft. Uh, I bring up the Mariner 2 specifically because uh, that measurement was made by Marsh Neugebauer, who is, uh, was at JPL and is now here in Tucson as an affiliate over at, at LPL. And she was one of the first people to actually measure this solar wind, this idea uh, of this continuous emission from the sun of this plasma and demonstrated that it wasn't just a theoretical idea, but something we could actually measure. Now, just to make sure we're on the same page, because I know we're not all familiar with all possible states of matter, and it's good to start and then build from uh, using a common language, I wanted to make sure that you all understood what I meant when I said a plasma. We're familiar with solids, these crystalline structures that are very locked in place. How do we get to something that's a bit more complicated? we just add energy, right? We just add a bit of uh, heat on your stove and you go from a solid to a liquid. What happens next if you allow the heat to continue being added, if you add more energy? You get steam, right? You transition solid, liquid, gas. From there, you just keep adding more energy to the system and you'll start to actually rip apart the atoms leading to the production of the, that plasma state. And it's these plasmas that fill up the entirety of the universe. Most of what we can see, those accretion disks, those nebulae, the sun itself, those are all plasmas. They're very uncommon here on Earth in this thin onion shell of an atmosphere we live in. But in the rest of the universe, it's pretty much what's out there. And so if we wanna understand all of those astrophysical objects, we need to understand fundamentally the interactions between these charged particles, these electrons, these protons, these charged minor ions, uh, and the electric and magnetic fields that they actually produce. Um, and so that's going to give us the ability to get an understanding of things like those accretion disks. This is a simulation uh, from colleagues out at JPL. Uh, for, from supernovae shells that are expanding out into the interstellar matter that's around them. And it's also going to allow us to be able to actually make and contain plasmas here on Earth. Uh, many of you may have heard about the, uh, the results from the National Ignition Facility, uh, where they took 192 lasers, rammed them into a gold-crusted uh, piece of hydrogen, and were able to extract more energy out of them than they were putting in. And that's through the process of, of fusion, actually getting that to work uh, requires understanding the, uh, the fun fundamental processes about, uh, about plasmas there. We also care because these plasmas affect us, not necessarily on an everyday basis, but affect us in a somewhat regular basis in the form of space weather. The sun is not uh, it's, it's, it's not the same. It's a very dynamic structure. Sometimes it uh, ejects tremendous amount of materials from it. So you have these occurrences like coronal mass ejections uh, that lead uh, to em the emission of not just light, but actually significant fractions of the sun's, uh, sun's uh, surface. The actual solar material is pushed off and in doing so will propagate through the solar system. If that actually hits uh, a planet, it, that hits our magnetic bubble around us, that will inject a tremendous amount of charged particles and energy into uh, our magnetosphere, that magnetic bubble, which can lead to significant impacts that can lead to uh, damaging, destroying, or at least breaking communications with, uh, with the various technological assets we have in space uh, that can allow, uh, that can prevent communications uh, using your GPS systems, for instance, or even leading to power blackouts, things that have happened uh, even in the last few decades when a uh, significant coronal mass ejection hit the earth, uh, leading to, to those kinds of blackouts. They also do produce auroras, which uh, for people in the northern latitudes you may have seen before, and certainly places like Iceland uh, love to show you these wonderful pictures. Um, 
And so to try to understand these fundamental processes, to try to understand exactly how the plasma fills the solar system, how the plasma uh, behaves, how the energy moves through it, NASA, uh, ESA, and other uh, organizations have launched an entire heliophysics system observatory, which is uh, shown not to scale here, of the 20 different operating missions that we have uh, filling effectively the entire solar system. So we have missions like Parker Solar Probe and Solar Orbiter that are plunging towards the sun's surface, probe getting as close as tens of billions of miles away from the sun's surface in order to understand how the young solar wind is actually born, how it's accelerated, and how it's structured to missions like Voyager that has actually moved all the way out to the very edge of our solar system and moving uh, outside of the, the, the bubble that is our, our heliosphere. We've also had a lot of missions that have been relatively close to the Earth, uh, trying to actually sit inside of that magnetic bubble or see the kinds of interactions between the solar wind as it blows into uh, and attempts to, uh, uh, in, uh, and it interacts uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, the magnetosphere that we have. So I find that cartoon is helpful, but it's also, as I said, not to scale, which, which means that you, know, you all understand distances here, you're, you're astronomers, and so I thought it'd be helpful to recast it in terms of the actual distances that we cover. Now, I'll point out that this is a, a logarithmic rather than a linear scale. Uh, you'll, uh, and what I'm showing here are a number of the different kinds, uh, the different missions that we've, uh, we've sent up in the last oh, let's call this five decades now. Um, and so by we, I definitely don't mean myself. Um, so you'll see that uh, a large number of them are centered right here, living relatively close to Earth. Missions like SOHO, WIND, DISCOVER, and ACE. Some of them, as I've mentioned, are uh, like Parker uh, and Solar Orbiter that have gone much, much closer to the sun. Others like Voyager, uh, and uh, New Horizons are moving very far away. And just to get a sense of, well, uh, if uh, this is in units of AU, and since it's logarithmic, we see that Voyager has gone more than 100 times further away from the sun than the Earth is, while Probe is plunging to a tenth of the distance, even less than that as we get closer and closer. Now, many of these missions don't have telescopes on them. They're not focused on actually gathering and light from a particular place, but measuring the local plasma conditions, which means that formally what we're going to be measuring are things like what you see on this right-hand plot. These are local measurements of, of effectively how dense and how fast the plasma are moving. These are nine different snapshots made by the Helios uh, spacecraft. So this was a joint mission between uh, Germany and the United States uh, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, where they, as they went closer and closer to the sun, what they saw was the gas did not remain in a nice isotropic distribution. Effectively, when I talk to you through this air, uh, there's a single temperature, whether you look at the, the distribution of velocities in this direction, in this direction, or in this direction, they're all the same. But as you get closer and closer to the sun, the magnetic field actually plays a role in organizing the plasma so that you no longer have these nice equal distributions of, of how likely you are to find a, 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 a proton at a particular velocity, but you start seeing much broader, much hotter distributions transverse or along the local magnetic field and understanding what's leading to those odd distributions, how that's affecting the thermodynamics of the systems is something that colleagues and I have been spending, well, decades of our lives understanding so we can apply those understandings to how energy moves through our stars, moves through planetary uh, nebula and moves through accretion disks. Um, now, one of the great things that we can do is actually send up spacecraft and have them sit there for quite some time. So this is a movie uh, made by the uh, good, good, colleague, uh, good friends and colleagues at the uh, Goddard uh, NASA uh, um, laboratory. Uh, and what this is showing, so the axes here are distances in thousands of kilometers away from the Earth. The Earth is sitting at the very center of that plot. The thing that's moving around rapidly is the moon. And then as we move further away, that star is the wind spacecraft. It was a mission that was launched more than a quarter century ago. And after taking a somewhat meandering route to get out there, 
is now sitting at the Lagrange one point, effectively the gravitational stability point between where the sun's uh, pull and the earth's pull cancel each other out. And it can sit there in effectively a station keeping uh, orbit and has been sitting there for decades and decades, which means that we have these very long statistical baselines for understanding how the solar wind changes and it's enabled us to study how energy moves through these systems and also have a great monitor for how uh, what the solar wind looks like right before it slams into the earth. Now, for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to focus in on one of these fundamental processes, namely turbulence, which may sound arcane, but it's really at the heart of, of all of the different plasma processes that we care about. Turbulence is... Uh, effectively multi-scale disorder. We're trying to understand how energy moves from very, very large scales to smaller and smaller and even smaller scales, and in doing so, understand eventually how these plasmas are going to get hot. Turbulence, which uh, at that left uh, is just a, a nice artistic representation, a very large injection of, of energy through these large waves, that break up into smaller and smaller pieces until eventually that's going to be dissipated through some collisional mechanism. That's a fluid case. Uh, we have the exact same kind of very large uh, scale structures being formed uh, when the solar wind runs into the magnetosphere. And then we want to understand the mechanisms that actually lead that energy injection at these very huge scales, structures that are as large or larger than the Earth, down to smaller and smaller scales until they eventually heat individual ions and electrons. And understanding those processes will give us a better insight into how cosmic plasmas get hot. Now, that may sound esoteric, so let's start off as I think probably many of us started off this morning with a cup of coffee, right? If you take your cup of coffee, you put some creamer in it and you give it a single stir, you've created this one eddy that's at the very largest scale. That eddy isn't just going to sit there and continually circle around, and it's also not just going to get stuck there. You're not looking at a, a can of paint that's so viscous that it's not going to keep moving. This is a fluid that will flow. That eddy is going to break up into, let's say, two smaller eddies, and then those will shear the other eddies that are of a similar size and continue to break down into even smaller and smaller th uh, 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 worlds effectively. This this quote from uh, Lewis Fry Richardson is one that that probably more poetically and evocatively states what I've been trying to. Big worlds have little worlds that feed on their velocity, and little worlds have lesser worlds, and so on to viscosity. The idea is that you have this transfer of energy from the outer scale of your coffee cup to smaller and smaller structures till some process acts more rapidly than that transfer to remove energy and actually heat up your coffee. Uh, you can sit down and do a calculation and show that it takes about five seconds for the energy that you inject at the outer scale of your coffee to break up down to the viscous scale, uh, which means, okay, you can get a sense of how quickly the energy moves through uh, and, and how, hotter, how much hotter that makes your, your coffee. In case of coffee, it's not that much hotter, but for these universal, these cosmic plasmas, it can be incredibly impactful. So fundamentally, what we want to do is understand how the energy is moving through the system, how it's distributed in the system, and what mechanisms actually lead to it being removed from the, from the plasma. Now, we don't have a large cup of coffee permeating the, the, the solar system. Rather, we have these plasmas. And because these are charged particles, they're going to respond to and actually create electric and magnetic fields. And those electric and magnetic fields will in turn make this system even more complicated. Effectively, they will act to uh, add additional ways, additional channels that the energy can be removed from the system. You're not just going to have collisional dissipation. You're going to have different electromagnetic ways where the uh, ions or the electrons could, be, uh, could get hotter. And there are vigorous, sometimes aggressive debates between different people about which of these channels are the ones that are actually operating. I went back to the beginning of the talk uh, when we looked at that, that image of Sagittarius A star, depending on which of these models you think is actually responsible for the heating, you get very different interpretations of the physical structures there. 
if it's Landau damping or if it's magnetic reconnection, you're going to have fundamentally different structures in terms of where the, uh, where, where the plasma is actually distributed. And so understanding how energies were moved from the system is vital to understanding all of these wonderful images that we're gathering in from across the universe. And so we want to really understand how energy moves through and is removed from the system and how it's ordered by the local magnetic fields. And so to do, uh, that, that uh, as I said, and this is just a, a laundry list, which I promise not to read every single bullet point, uh, but the, it's, it's really essential for understanding both how energy moves through, say, those accretion disks, but also for distributing the mass uh, that, that effectively seeds the different stars and planetary formations and the different systems that we care about. If you have one kind of turbulence, effectively, if you don't allow pressure compressions to move through the system, you get a very different distribution of matter in your uh, protostellar nebulae than you do if you allow pressure compressive fluctuations in there. And so depending on which of those models you have, you're going to have very different background systems for your, for your stars to form from. So understanding the nature of the, the turbulence is necessary for being able to appropriately model where all these stars came from and how they're going to evolve in the future. Now, I've already hopefully motivated the fact that we have this wonderful heliophysics system observatory. So what's needed? Why do we need to launch this new mission? Well, the essential element here is that we need to be able to measure this plasma, this system, not at a single point and not at a few points, but at many points covering multiple scales simultaneously. We need to effectively measure the injection of energy and then how the energy moves through the system and then how the energy is removed from the system, which all happens at different scales. We effectively need to be at each place in the waterfall in order to get a, a, a holistic picture of the thermodynamics of the system. Think about it in this way. Effectively, if you have this really complicated structure and all you're able to see is just along this single red line cutting through it, you can get some idea of what's happening, but you're not going to fully grasp the complexity of that system. We have, uh, and both NASA and the European Space Agency has launched a few different missions, missions known as CLUSTER and MMS, that have launched four spacecraft uh, at a time. And that enables you to look at the structure, but focused on a single scale at a single point in time. This is perhaps an overly busy plot, but the X and Y axes here represent both the physical scales as well as the time scales that these missions have been able to observe. What we need to do with Helioswarm is measure not just at this very large scale where the plasma behaves like a fluid or at these smaller scales where you actually can resolve the individual behavior of the charged ions or the negatively charged electrons, but we need to uh, uh, simultaneously measure the how the plasma behaves at all of those different scales, which is why we've at least at this level, drawn a box around multiple different scales, which are the different separations that we're going to be able to measure with helios. And so um, to provide, and this is mostly for this audience, uh, a bit of background, this is not a new idea. This is not something that five years ago we all said, that'd be great to do. This is something that has uh, uh, been thought about in the community back to at least 1980, uh, when NASA... Uh, sponsored a, um, a, a report uh, and, uh, written by JPL that said you really should, in order to study turbulence, not keep launching one spacecraft at a time, but you really need to launch N spacecraft. You can tell it was written by a theorist because they weren't uh, concerned with the economics of how large N would be. Um, and I, I, I would point out as well uh, that at least two of these authors, uh, Randy Jockpe and Chuck Sonnet, uh, were, were professors here at the University of Arizona. And so they were both really engaged with this idea that you needed to measure not at one point, not at a few, but as many as you could economically uh, get up there. And so 
um, that's where we actually get to the, the underlying concept of, of Helioswarm, which we was selected by the NASA Explorers program earlier this year after several years of development and going through a competitive process, proposing to NASA, writing the so-called concept study report, where we said, this is why this is an important question. This is how we'll execute it. Well, we've now come to the this is how we'll execute it part of the mission. So to give us a sense and to ground us, because we'll be using these coordinate systems uh, for uh, the next few slides, um, at the very center of this, this is similar to that wind movie I showed earlier, uh, is the Earth. Uh, and so that's either here, here, or here. Um, this top right panel, uh, we're looking down at the Earth. This open circle here is the moon orbiting around it. And then that black dot is uh, where the mission is actually going to be, the actual Helioswarm Observatory. Uh, here's a side-on view, and here's just a nice angular view to try to give you a, a three-dimensional representation of this. The three different colors represent the different kinds of plasmas, and therefore the different kinds of turbulence that we're going to be measuring over one year in the life of this mission. We're going to get both pristine solar wind that's blown to us from the um, from the sun and effectively has just had three days of travel time from the sun's surface out to, uh, out to the earth, and it won't be impacted by the local magnetic bubble. Everything in blue, well, that's going to be stuff that's inside that local magnetic bubble. And everything in green is the stuff that's going to be magnetically connected to it that's going to have a, a different set of characteristics. Effectively, uh, waves will be able to travel along those magnetic fields and in doing so, drive a, different, uh, drive a different kind of turbulence than you'll see in either the red or the blue region. Now, I know RE, which are the units I've written up here, they stand for Earth radii, is maybe not the natural unit you all think of. And so I've just put in context, first of all, that's about 6,000 or so kilometers. Uh, but to give you an idea of where some other technolo technological assets sit, uh, the uh, International Space Station is at 0.05 RE. So that would not even be resolvable on, on this plot right here. Well, all of the GPS satellites are sitting at about, let's say that uh, 3.2 RE or so. Helioswarm is going to vary between 60, going all the way out to the moon uh, Earth distance, down to about 12 Earth radii. So we're going to be relatively far out there. However, this is not what makes the mission unique. What makes the mission unique is the fact that we're not launching one, we're not launching four, but we're launching nine spacecraft. There's going to be this central hub uh, that's going to launch uh, into this uh, lunar resonant orbit. And then it's going to deploy a set of eight nodes that are all going to be identically instrumented. And their individual trajectories are going to have been designed in such a way that some of the separations are very close to that hub, giving us separations between spacecraft that are on the order of tens of kilometers, while others are going to be much, much further apart, giving us separations that are thousands of kilometers at any one time. Uh, what we see here are just projections in the uh, three different orthogonal directions. So we're never ending up in a condition where we have just a simple string of pearls or uh, filling a single plane in, but we're actually filling the three-dimensional volume up, which is what we really need in order to see how the plasma turbulent, uh, how the turbulent fluctuations reorder uh, the energy, mass, and momentum in these systems. Um, scales are, are tricky, and so I thought it would be useful maybe to project up here what, what we actually mean when we're talking about thousands of kilometers apart. Uh, this is a projection of the uh, eight different node positions relative to the hub. That hub is right there in, oh, that is in St. Louis, yep. Um, I think we were we had played around with trying to put it in slightly different places. It doesn't quite span the entire east-west distance, but it definitely gets us north-south. Um, so we see some of the hubs uh, are kind of the ones responsible for the very large baselines, and others are the ones that are responsible for the for the relatively small ones. Um, so what are we actually going to be measuring when we're up there? Well, we're going to be measuring both the actual plasma, the actual charged particles themselves, as well as the magnetic fields that are responsible for 
pushing and pulling the, uh, those charged particles. Uh, the, the measurement of the actual plasma are going to be made with these things called Faraday cups. Effectively, they, uh, they measure a current of charged particles moving across these gratings. These are things that have been used for decades now. The actual versions of the Faraday cups we're going to be using are the same ones that are used on that wind spacecraft I talked about earlier, as well as the one that's currently fly flying on Parker Solar Probe that is going to within tens of millions of miles of the sun's surface, which means they're quite robust. And in NASA speak, they have high heritage, which means we know how they operate, uh, and they should be, uh, hopefully, relatively easy to, uh, to, to build and install. Uh, in order to measure the, uh, ma uh, the magnetic field, we're going to be using magnetometers from colleagues out in both the UK and in France, uh, in the same way that you use different telescopes to look at different frequencies of photons, we have to use different kinds of magnetometers in order to resolve different frequency ranges of, of magnetic fields. So that's why on each of the spacecraft, we're going to have two different kinds of magnetometers. This plot over here shows these relatively smaller nodes. Uh, Machines are noisy things, and so we actually stick the nodes on ends of booms to try them to get them as far away from the magnetic fields that are, are uh, intrinsic to these sort uh, to uh, to these actual uh, spacecraft themselves. So we have both the magnetometer and these uh, the flux gate and search coil magnetometer on the opposite ends of these nodes. The central object here is the hub. Uh, the hub is the uh, effectively an S-bearing for those of you that are familiar with, with engineering spacecraft talk, and it will carry all eight of the nodes up to the science orbit and then deploy them in a pairwise fashion. So here we see uh, each of those, eight, uh, we see four of the eight nodes sitting on there, uh, and then the central hub will have the same instrumentation as the nodes. And then it will have an additional uh, way of measuring the, uh, the, the protons and also minor ions that will provide a higher fidelity measurement of those protons, effectively giving us a more uh, sensitive picture, more pixels uh, of that distribution function. So how do we actually get the observatory into place? Well, uh, we're going to be using effectively the same orbit or at least a very similar orbit that uh, both Laddie and TESS used. Those were missions to, to look at. Uh, well, TESS is to look at uh, many of those, uh, those exoplanets out there. So we do three uh, phasing orbits to get ourselves uh, out to the lunar distance. And then once we're out there, we do a, a swing by gravitational assist from the moon in order to get us effectively into the science orbit that we're, uh, we're looking for there. And then we have a year's worth of time uh, where we can continue to orbit around and sample those different kinds of plasmas. As I already said, um, and once we're in, uh, in that particular orbit, uh, the hub doesn't need to maneuver at all. It's just going to keep moving around uh, just following the, the various gravitational forces that are associated with it. Um, as I said, we'll deploy the pair, the nodes in a pairwise fashion. So once the hub is out to where it's supposed to be, every two weeks, we'll eject two of the nodes. We'll make sure they can talk to each other, that they can, well, that, that they will talk to the hub. Uh, they'll get their instruments deployed and turned on. And then two weeks later, uh, we will uh, eject the next two, deploy them, calibrate them, make sure they're working. And then as we come back down to perigee, we'll deploy the next two. And that process will happen, as I said, every two weeks for the first four weeks of the, of the, uh, the mission. And then once, uh, once we have all eight out, will actually have the distribution of spacecraft that we need to answer those questions about how energy moves through this system. Um, the other thing that I, I really want to, uh, to acknowledge is that the Ames uh, Flight Dynamics team really did a outstanding job of actually designing this observatory. These nodes are not continuously fly, uh, firing their thrusters in order to keep in this configuration. We only have an occasional one or two trim maneuvers for every uh, two weeks. Um, 
because we don't want to disturb the plasma that we're trying to measure, uh, which means that they had to very carefully design exactly where these spacecraft would be uh, in order to satisfy the very particular requirements of, well, we want this one to be thousands of kilometers away, so it needs to have a much more elongated orbit. Uh, it, it's, it was just outstanding working with these people, actually figuring out these trajectories and getting everything uh, in exactly the right place. Um, so how do we actually quantify that things are in the right place? Well, we have two different criteria. One is making sure that the actual separations between the spacecraft span all of those scales that we need them to. Uh, and so uh, this is our nice visualization of what we mean by the word baseline. Uh, it's just, well, as the, the name suggests, the separation between any of those two uh, spacecraft. Because we have nine spacecraft, the number of unique baselines we have is nine times eight divided by two. If you go back to your combinatorics class, which means we're going to have 36 of these to work with. And so what we did and working with the, the flight dynamics team is make sure that all of those different baselines actually line up in a way that we span all of those different physical scales. So this is, again, that same uh, uh, looking down onto the equatorial plane of our solar system uh, is that top right panel showing where the observatory is, where the moon is. And uh, all of these black dots, these swarm of different points, represents the different baselines between the, 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 the nine spacecraft, so the 36 different baselines projected into uh, a three-dimensional volume. Why are we doing that? Well, we don't want all the spacecraft just sitting in a straight line of pearls, because what if the interesting physics is happening transverse to that? Well, we can't exactly throw up a, a signal and have everything turn immediately. We need to make sure that we're fully spanning all three directions. And so we're going to get uh, hundreds, thousands of hours where we span all three different directions across all three uh, different scales simultaneously. However, that's not the only requirement that we've uh, imposed on, this, uh, on these configurations. We also want to make sure that the actual three-dimensional, uh, the ability to resolve three-dimensional structure is necessary. If you want to understand how a structure is ch changing, one of the best ways to do that is to basically look at how it changes across four different points in space. Think about if you have, say, a... Um, uh, a weather front moving past you, uh, say on, on Earth, if you're just measuring it at a single point, you're, you're only going to be able to see that weather front moving past that single point. If you want to really resolve how it's changing in a two-dimensional sense, you need to measure it at three points. If you want to measure it in a, a full three-dimensional sense, you need to resolve it at least four different points, which requires the construction of these different uh, tetrahedra, effectively the, these pyramids here. Formally, you could have tetrahedra that are effectively lined up in a, uh, in a string of pearls again, or uh, flattened out in kind of a pancake situation. Both of those are going to be relatively error prone to how the, 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 the inferred structure that you're measuring. And so what we want, what we asked uh, for from the flight dynamics team is to make sure that all of the configurations, or at least many of the configurations, were in this regular or pseudospherical pattern, not in the pancake, the sausage, or the potato. Uh, you could tell we were somewhat hungry while making this plot. Um, and so in the same way that we were able to see the, um, the, the, the good baseline coverage, we're also able to have that same kind of good coverage with very regular structures um, for, the, uh, uh, for these different kinds of, of tetrahedra, polyhedra more generally. This x-axis right here represents just how good, how close to a sphere you actually are. Uh, and this y-axis here represents the actual size of the structure. If you have one tetrahedra that's really, really small, you're not going to get information about changes on very large scales. And since this is a multi-scale mission, what we fundamentally want to see is to see tetrahedra that are both very small and very large simultaneously. And so we are going to capture thousands of hours uh, where we have both large and small tetrahedra in all of those different plasma environments that will allow us to see how the structures change in a, a wide variety of different plasma uh, and, and solar wind conditions. 
So um, with that, I just want to give, uh, give a second to, again, thank all of the uh, wonderful scientists and engineers that have put in blood, sweat, and tears on this over the last uh, now five years. Um, and and to, uh, to thank them all, both the science team that's named up here, as well as all the engineers at these institutions. Uh, and so with that, uh, more details can be found at that website there, uh, which is also, I think, accessible by the QR code on the handout that was provided to you. Um, and with that, I will just leave this, uh, this image up here. Um, and uh, with that, I will uh, uh, take your questions. Thank you. Okay, so do we have any questions from Facebook? I okay. saw at least one question was in the chat. Okay, we're going to do Zoom questions. Okay, on Zoom. Uh... Summers asks, uh, is there any special reason why the moon has been modeled in the geometric position simulations? Is it just for scale or is there something more fundamental to know about its interaction with the observatory? It's, it's mostly for scale. Uh, it's also to remind uh, us that it's uh, in order to get into these orbits, it's a lunar resonant orbit. So we had to do a swing by out there. Um, if you, because it's a lunar resonant orbit, uh, and if you watch these for long enough, you'll note that we're, the observatory is never near the moon, and so we're not actually going to be measuring the plasma that's near the moon. Um, uh, but it does uh, at least give us a sense of what the nature of the plasma is at those distances. So if you, say, are sending people to the moon and want to understand the solar wind conditions that the moon typically runs into, it will provide some background context for that. Do we have any Facebook? Okay. So Sarah from Facebook uh, says, how long will they be up in space? So the, the prime science mission is going to be for, for one year. Uh, and the, the reason for that is it allows us to sample each of those different uh, each of those different kinds of environments. Because once we're in the lunar resonant orbit, uh, the, the orbit is inertially frozen, and so as the Earth goes around the sun, you'll start to sample the pristine solar wind and then the magnetosphere and then that foreshock, this, this green area right here. Uh, the instruments are all designed in such a way that they will last longer than a year. Uh, the spacecraft are robust enough that they should as well, uh, but the focus of the mission is to, to make sure that we get that one full year of, the, of science observations. Any other Facebook questions? Okay, if people in the room uh, who have questions, if you will raise your hand. Okay, I'm proceeding toward the back. Oh no, this is fine. You may sit anywhere. We're glad to, to reach out to you, make sure you get to ask your questions. Well, thank you. Um, the perturbing factors that you're doing the trim maneuvers for, what is generating those in the system? Because it seems like it's fairly compact in its energy usage. What what causes that? I'm thinking canoeing in white water and putting your paddle in the water. It's a perturbing factor on a local scale. I just wondered what does that here? Is it uh, solar wind? Uh, it, we're, we're, we're at a point where it's, um, I don't think the, the, ram pressure from the solar wind is sufficiently small that it's not going to be leading to those perturbations. I will be honest, I'm not a flight dynamicist, and so I will not answer with authority, uh, but I can reach out to my colleagues and actually ascertain what the specific uh, perturbing forces that they're considering, because they actually have different fidelities of models where they start with the you just consider the Earth, Moon, and Sun, and then they start adding in additional elements to that to make sure that they understand, well, this one's going slightly off, and, and what was the actual additional force that was in, included there. So they have very sophisticated tools for modeling this, and I am not the one that's responsible for running them, so I don't want to give the wrong answer there. Awesome. Thank you. Certainly. Okay, other questions in the room?
Yeah. I'm just wondering if you have eight different teams working with each one uh, of the modules or or how that works, how, so how the, the information is interpreted. Let's see if I have the architecture slide in here. Uh, so we have a, a broad group of scientists and engineers from across the US and across the world. All of that data is going to be brought into a central so-called mission oper uh, missions operations center. So uh, for those of you not familiar, there's this wonderful system of antenna called the Deep Sky uh, Deep Space Network that talks to each of our assets that are relatively far from the Earth. That data is downloaded. Uh, it's then going to be processed by the missions operations center. Each of the people, each of the labs that build the different instruments are going to calibrate the data, send it back to the missions operations center. That will then be pushed out to the science operations center. That's going to be at UNH. And that's where all of the data will actually be made public. Because that's another thing that we're very focused on is this is not just data for us to play with. This is data for us to make sure that it's good, that it's actually transformed currents into measurement of magnetic field and then to release it to the public to the scientific community and to the community broadly uh, to let them see what they can do with it and make sense of it try to, to understand it and so we don't have one team for each node we have a science and an engineering team that will do that calibration will do that uh, that initial analysis and then we have a broad community of heliophysicists that are champing at the bit right now to, to get their hands on this and we'll just have to wait another um, well until the end of the decade so so she said thank you um okay do we have other hands right It'll take me just a second here uh, beyond this plasma that you're going to be studying, is there anything else that you might uh, discover by doing this? Like, um, since these satellites are at such great distances, I'm thinking, would it be able to spot any like gravitational waves or anything? Uh, uh, so I, like that? I don't know that we're going to have the sensitivity to actually measure gravitational waves moving past us, right? There, there have been missions that are proposed that are going to know their relative positions well enough that they can actually sense a gravitational uh, perturbation moving past them. And this, the focus of this mission wasn't to build instruments to do that. And so we're just not gonna have the right instruments to, to make that kind of measurement. Um, there have been other cases where unexpected science arises that you have missions that, the instruments that are designed to measure uh, say electric fields, and then, well, it, it just so happens that dust particles start to, to collide onto them and you can start inferring information about the very small dust material out there using a radio antenna. And so there's the possibility that something serendipitous like that may happen, uh, but we're just gonna have to wait and see what crops up in the data to, to build up those, those kinds of observations. Other questions in the room? Okay. Can you say something about the uh, radiation environment that the observatory may experience? It looks like it might be going through the Van Allen belts. And so I'm thinking- It, yeah. it is uh, yeah. going to pass through them once and then stay outside of that area. So um, the, uh, the uh, where's this living? Uh, here we go. Um, so, we're going to be spending most of our time just because of, of Kepler, most of our time is going to be spent relatively far away. And then the, uh, the closest approaches are going to be down at 12, uh, 11 and a half, 13 kind of earth radii distances. And so we're going to be relatively far out of that environment. So missions like RBSP or the Van Allen radiation storm belt probes uh, lived in that environment. And it's a very harsh environment and we are, trying to stay out of that as much as possible. Okay. Other questions? Make sure you wave your hand where I can see you. Okay. If there are no other questions toward the back of the room, I'm gonna start <laughs> heading down front <laughs> and I'm getting wave, people waving. So that's really good. Thank you so much. It makes it much easier to find you here. So let's see. Uh, are there neutral particles in the 
solar wind. Um, how many of them are there relative to the charged particles? How do they participate in the plasma and how do they affect the measurements you hope to make? So the solar wind is a nearly fully ionized plasma. Uh, so the, the, so the, the neutrals do exist, uh, but it is a very diffuse system in which there aren't as many neutrals. Some of those more uh, distant plasmas, the interstellar media, some different kinds of nebulae have a much higher fraction of neutrals and they will interact with the rest of the plasma with effectively binary collisions, basically just collisions between two different hard bodies that will exert an overall fluid drag on the system. And so understanding that neutral fraction and understanding how it impacts things is, is important. Uh, it's, it's not going to be very significant for the, this kind of plasma we're going to be directly measuring. Okay, I'm making my way over to the other side of the room here a bit to get to another question. There you go. Yeah, uh, what uh, elements make up the plasma? So the plasma from the solar wind is about 95% uh, protons. So just hydrogen in its simplest form with the electron ripped off of it. Uh, there is a, a small fraction, sometimes usually between about 4 and 8% of helium atoms, which have had their electrons removed. And then the rest of it, there are trace uh, materials of your oxygen, a little bit of iron, but that's all relatively far down there. Uh, we're going to be mostly focused on measuring the protons, that central, uh, uh, more high fidelity measurement of the plasma that will be made at the hub will also have the necessary sensitivity to, to measure those alphas, those, those uh, helium uh, atoms as well. Okay, any other questions toward the back of the room before I go down to the front? All right, I'm headed down to the front. Here, I can, I can help out. Okay, so I have two questions and unrelated, but related to what you've said. Um, first, you alluded to the d dynamics of plasmas affecting how star clusters are formed. Mm -hmm. And so is it, is it that the models are trying to match what we see or that they're different models to describe different forms of star clusters? So there are different models that depend on the, the, the nature of the turbulence itself. Basically, how is it being stirred and what kind of fluctuations are allowed to propagate through it? If you allow pressure or compressive fluctuations, you get a different distribution of mass. If you have that different distribution of mass, you're going to have a different distributions of, of where your stars will actually form. And so understanding how the mass is distributed is one of those fundamental questions we have about turbulence. Okay, all right. And then the second question um, is the moon. Does the moon interact with the plasma? Yes. And affect it then? Uh, yes, it, it, it does. Uh, uh, and uh, so any, anything that moves through the plasma will form some sort of shock with it. The moon does not have the same uh, large elongated magnetic structure around it. And so it undergoes a very different kind of interaction with the plasma. Uh, and in fact, each of the different planets and moons in our solar system, depending on the strength and structure of their magnetic field, have different kinds of interactions with the solar wind. And that's also impacted by just how close or far away that particular body is. And so that is actually a, uh, a kind of investigation that other missions have, have been undergoing. I think Bepi Colombo is one that's actually gone out to Mercury to try to understand the Mercury solar wind uh, interactions. Okay, we have one more question in the room and then I think we have another one on Zoom as well. So, Can you go back to the other slide that showed your um, architecture? Yes, I can. Thank you. Yes, okay, so 
So your nine spacecraft, you have your hub and then your individual spacecraft. Yep. Do the individual spacecraft talk to the hub only? Yes. So that is one of the architectural elements of this is that this is not a constellation of distinct spacecraft. This is a swarm right. where we from uh, the uh, mission operating center talk to the hub. The hub then talks to the nodes. The nodes then talk back to the hub. And then they, that information is passed back down. So we don't talk to each of the nine spacecraft individually. Okay. So that my follow-up to that now that I know that, my follow-up is so you're going to be taking the space network mm -hmm. and the deep space network mm -hmm. and you're going to feed that data from the hub to the mission ops mm -hmm. and then they're going to distribute it correctly. Yes. Okay. Yep. This is my wheelhouse. Got it. So <laughs> I, I I was starting to sense that. So <laughs> okay. I, I built satellites for <laughs> decades. So so my question is. Are you going to launch these equatorially or are you going because of the the way I saw those um, yeah, patterns? It, you're good. You say launch site is TBD. You're yes. Five uh, years out, you almost have to know what that is, right? We There are two different options. Uh, e either Wallops or or the Cape will work for us. I knew it. Um, and and uh, so the. If, if we go into the weeds, the way that the announcement of opportunity for this project worked, uh, there were two different launch options that we had to be able to okay. conform with, and, and we can make either of those two uh, launch options work okay. for us. Have you picked your, um, uh, who's going to take your payload um, your launch vehicle? It, that has not been decided and announced yet. Uh, there are leading candidates. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm happy. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, let me make sure that I've gotten everyone in the room now. If anyone else has come up with a question, let me know. Don't worry about distance. We'll get to you. Okay. We are working it out here. There we go. I'm just wondering, are you kind of hoping for a CME or something like that? Yes. In fact, um, I did not pay you to ask this question while the slide was up. Um, but but one of the things that we uh, looked at was the likelihood of encountering different kinds of solar wind phenomena. So not only these coronal mass ejections, uh, but different other kinds of large scale structures that naturally arise. And we predicted that given the part of the solar cycle that we launch into, um, we were expecting to get uh, probably hundreds of hours um, in the in CMEs uh, and some fraction of that where everything is aligned in exactly those type, types of good configurations that I was talking about earlier. Um, and so, yes, we, we are statistically hoping to, to, uh, to see that kind of structure because it's, it's a different kind of turbulence and we'd really like to see how that's different than the pristine stuff that's just aged nicely from the sun's surface. Okay. So we will get to our patient person on Zoom who's waiting. All right, from Zoom, um, what is the estimated lifespan of the mission? One year, I think we covered that already. Okay. Yep. And what did Ulysses that gave a 3D measurement give us? So Ulysses, uh, if we go back here, uh, ba -ba bum. Ulysses did something quite special. Uh, it didn't stay in the equator. Uh, it went out of the equatorial plane. In order to do that, it had to fly all the way out to Jupiter, uh, but then it was able to get us this nice equatorial view and therefore not only measured the plasma that's being emitted uh, in the kind of the, the streamer belt structure, but see how the plasma uh, was different in, uh, in, in basically from the poles. Um, so that's that's what it gave us. It was still just the single spacecraft, and so it doesn't give us that the the structure of of the of the the turbulent plasma up there. Um, but it, it there's a lot of tremendous uh, science that that was accomplished with that mission. All right, and the last question from Zoom: Can you help us understand the nature and dynamics of the foreshock part of the plasma geometry? I. How how do we best understand this type of interaction? 
I can if I can get my screen to work properly. Um, so the foreshock, um, think about it, let's think about it this way. Um, one more, here we go. So the foreshock is this area in, in green, uh, in, that's not super visible. Uh, that area in green right here, I'll stop trying to navigate there, the area in green right here. Um, so that's not within the magnetic bubble of the Earth's magnetosphere, um, but it is still, connected effectively you have magnetic field lines that are going to drape over from the solar wind uh, and and connect much closer to the the earth with it now if you think about magnetic fields in some ways they can act like rubber bands effectively um, if you uh, pull on it you're going to have a perturbation that will be uh, that will move along it and so you're going to get a whole cacophony of different kinds of waves and other phenomenon that will transmit information, mass and, and energy as well along those, uh, those magnetic field lines. And so that's why we've set out both inside the, uh, the magnetosphere as well as in that foreshock region as two different areas of locally strongly driven turbulence that are going to be different than that red region, that pristine solar wind. And so that's, that's uh, why we've highlighted those at all, as all distinct regions. Okay, I think that's all the questions for Dr. Klein right now. Now, those of you who are present at, at the meeting tonight, you're very fortunate because Dr. Klein has decided to hang out with us the, the rest of the evening. So you'll, you'll have a chance to corner him some more. Um, and also, Dr. Klein, you should realize that it's our philosophy in this organization that if you once come and give us information about a project, then we expect follow-ups from you later. Certainly, certainly. <laughs> and so we expect you to come back and update us at some point in the future. I, I certainly am excited to do that as we move through the different mission phases and hopefully uh, have uh, some wonderful data in uh, 28 or 29. So. Wonderful. Yeah. We'll be looking forward to that. Thank you so much. Thank and just you. Have a seat anywhere. Our next item on the agenda tonight is that we have two people, uh, Gus Gomez and um, Ben Bailey, who are going to give us an update on uh, some things about our Tempa Dark Sky site. And so, and I think both Gus and Ben are going to be attending through Zoom. Is that right? Okay. So Ben or Gus, uh, whichever one of you are going to give the presentation, you should be able to share. So go ahead and you can, and let me uh, allow you to talk. You should be able to talk. Okay, I think I'm there. You guys got me? Yeah, we can hear you, Gus. You need to share your pitch. Ah, okay. And share down here. Okay, the slides are not. Uh yet we're working on it there we go okay we've got you got it's there yes okay uh let me see i've got some other stuff on the screen but <laughs> so you just see my picture i've got other stuff on the screen so i'm not sure what i'm seeing or what i'm presenting here seeing the picture of you i assume at tampa oh okay. Okay. Um, okay and that's it okay then that's the one okay uh i'm gus gomez uh and i'm gonna be giving the presentation today on uh what's going on at tampa uh the this is one of our dark sites that some of you uh, are familiar with 
Uh, TIMPA stands for the uh, in Tucson International Monoplex Association. It's located out in the west of Tucson. It's about seven miles past the uh, uh, Desert Museum. Uh, it's, uh, TIMPA is an organization that they fly radio controlled model airplanes out there. There's also another association, a rocketry group that they use the facility to launch their rockets. And uh, I've been there a couple of nights where the rocketry people do a night launch and that is really a, a treat. You're there looking at a double star and you hear a countdown and then it's, you've got a rocket flying up in the sky. It's a, it's a sight to see, so that's a lot of fun. Uh, the, the property belongs to the city of Tucson and it is leased by uh, the Tempa organization. Uh, specifically, the Parks and Recreation is the guys who are in charge of that uh, facility. Uh, in 96, we had a member who contacted Tempa about uh, maybe joining them. Since the Tempa and Sarah will be using the site during the day, we'd be able to use it at night. So uh, we used it uh, for about a year, and then we reached an agreement with uh, the Tempa organization that we would use, we would have unlimited use of the site for uh, start parties and for use by members at all other times. Uh, now, T T AAA does pay Tempa an annual fee for the site, for the use of the site. So we are like renters to, to the Tempa organization. And uh, Tempa, uh, I must make a note, is a members only dark site. So you can't just show up and say, I wanna set up my telescope and uh, look around, but you have to uh, join the club. And that is one of the benefits of uh, joining TAAA. Location, well, uh, if on the right-hand side, you'll have the uh, Tucson Mountains. Down in this area, down in this corner is the uh, uh, Desert Museum. And there's a road uh, reservation. Uh, it's a mile, mile wide road that runs right along the bottom here. And then it heads up north and that's where you get to Tempa. So it's way out west of Tucson. Try to get as far away from the city lights as we can. And it's a, it's a fairly good dark site. Now you zoom in on uh, that uh, facility and you'll see down here in the lower right-hand corner, there's a dirt road that comes in. There's a barn that sits right here. And right here is the gate. So you need a key to get into that gate. So that's a, uh, well, you need to be a member in order to get uh, access to the the, uh, the facility. And then a long dirt road that comes in. And then this is the facility that the Tempa people use. They have uh, their uh, uh, runway. They have a uh, Ramada for them to use when they uh, set up their uh, uh, equipment. And there's also bathroom facilities here. So that we're able to use that at uh, when uh, we're out there at uh, doing uh, night observations. Zoom in on what we've got. This is a, what, as you drive in, you'll notice there's a big telescope loaner storage container. That's where we keep the uh, telescopes for the uh, loaner program, which you can borrow. And then you take them out to the different pads and for use at, for that night. Located also at Timpa is the Gila Monster, what has been named the Gila Monster. It's actually a Mead 14 inch uh, telescope. So it's a, uh, Fairly nice, we use it for uh, star parties and uh, uh, stuff like that. We've also done some uh, upgrades to the area. We had a couple of benches that uh, with time and weather, they uh, start, started falling apart. So we brought them in, we fixed them up, we painted them white because it's easy to see at night. And those two are out there in, in use. We also uh, bought a couple of picnic tables also for use uh, during star parties. And then if, if it's, if they're available, uh, any member who is using one of these pads can take one of the tables and use it as a uh, workbench or something like that. So there is a, a availability of, for the, of the tables for that. Uh, one of the issues we had is when people would come in late at night, we couldn't tell where the pads were and where the, the surrounding uh, ground was. So we went in there and we painted the pads and there is enough ambient light out there that it's easy to see where the pads are. So it keeps people from driving over them. That's a, that's a good thing there. One of the other issues we had was at night uh, getting to the bathroom. Uh, it turns out there was a lot of bushes, a lot of uh, grass growing. So we ended up clearing a path over to the uh, bathrooms. And there's these uh, cement uh, parking uh, slabs, I guess you could call them. 
So those are also painted white. So it gives you a, a good uh, walk walkway to get over to the bathroom. And I must note that there is a lot of life, uh, wildlife out there. One day I was out there and there was a deer right behind me. It was a nice big buck with I think a four point buck. And we've run into javelin out there, coyotes, owls. So there's a lot of uh, desert uh, uh, critters out there. So uh, don't be surprised if you see those guys out there. The Gila monster, this is the 14 inch meat Gila monster. Uh, we had to go in there and repair the doors with uh, time. They started warping and uh, the, there wasn't a good seal. We started getting a lot of dust and, and also a couple of uh, mice would start getting in there. So we had to go in and repair, repair those doors. And we also took a look at the roof and it needed a nice re-roofing, I guess it would be. And Ralph Meads, who uh, runs this facility, he used to work as a roofer, so he knew what to do. He went in there and replaced the roof. So now we've got a nice uh, roll off uh, house for the uh, telescope with a, a new doors and uh, a new roof. Some of the other things we've added is more signs. Uh, as you're driving up the road heading towards the uh, Timpa place, there is a turnoff and we put up a sign there that shows you this way to the telescope. We've also added some markers like these down here in the lower, lower, lower right, right hand side, blue markers. We have red ones and then when they turn to blue, that's the sign that you're supposed to turn and that's where the road is to get over to where the telescopes are. Uh, parking, we've got a sign that shows you where to park as you drive in. And then uh, we've also added a sign for some of the uh, temple people would uh, take RVs and park out where our telescope is. And we had instances where they parked on the slabs and we were afraid that some of those RVs may end up cracking the slabs and uh, now they're no longer uh, nice, flat, even uh, surfaces. So we put up a sign asking them to uh, not park on there. And last time we were out there, we saw the wheel tracks. They were not on the slab so that they did read the sign so that we're glad uh, that they did that. So those are just some of the additions, some of the new stuff that's been going on Timpa. But the real exciting one is that we're getting a new telescope. Uh, this is the uh, Mead uh, LX200, uh, uh, I guess the LX200 uh, 16 inch telescope. Now this telescope belonged to the Minnesota Astronomical Society. Uh, they had it set up in their uh, dark site and it ended up getting damaged by a, uh, a, a little mouse. I just crawled in there and did some damage to it. So they took it down, they sent it over to Mead Telescopes. Now, while this telescope was being repaired, the club received another donation of another telescope just like it. So they put that one in place of this guy. So then when they received their original telescope, they had a telescope with no place to go. Now, one of our members uh, who is from Minnesota, and uh, some of you people may know who he is, uh, he sort of uh, suggested to the Minnesota club that the, the TAAA well, we have a facility where we could set this guy up. So uh, the Astronomical League talked about it, they voted on it, and they decided to donate this telescope to TAAA. Uh, they, the donation came into the board, we voted on it, and we accepted it, and we're gonna be getting it. This, uh, then, then the decision was made to place this over at Tempa at the uh, dark side. So now we'll have two uh, big telescopes out at the uh, Timpa. And as we've been talking about this telescope, we keep referring it to as the, as the Timpa 16 versus the Gila monster for the other one. So we've sort of decided on that name. Uh, it's not the official name, but if you hear Timpa 16, that's what we're talking about. Now, who is this team? Uh, there are six of us on the team. John Mead is the team lead. Uh, ben Bailey, who was our ex-president for TAAA, he works as the uh, uh, liaison between TIMPA and TAAA, and he will be pre probably given this same presentation to the TIMPA group next Tuesday, I believe, to let them know what we're doing out there. Uh, Ralph Means is a facility leader for TIMPA. He's the one that has the, the keys and opens and closes the facility. And when he doesn't do that, I'm, I'm there available to do that. And then Dennis Means uh, is also a, a team member and uh, he lives close to the uh, Tempa area. So he's help, uh, helpful in, uh, in uh, anything we need to get out there that if we need somebody close by. 
And of course, May, our president, he's, she serves as their board of directors liaison. So she sort of makes sure that uh, uh, keeps us in touch with what's going on as far as the board of directors and you know when it comes to things about insurance and stuff like that. So uh, she's part of the, our team. Well, we had expected to receive this, this guy back in December. Well, as you all know, if you ship something in December, it's going to cost you a pretty penny. And the shipping companies were the first ones to tell us that. Now, the telescope and the fork weigh in excess of 200 pounds. Now, the shipping con container is also going to be pretty hefty because you can't just put this guy in a plastic, uh, in a cardboard box and ship it out there. So that's going to add to the, uh, the weight. Now the Minnesota club, uh, they paid over a thousand dollars when they transported the uh, scope to and from me to have it uh, fixed. So we came up with an estimate about that. And it actually, actually yesterday we found out it's closer to about $950 to have it shipped from Minnesota down here to uh, Tucson. So then we've decided and we're working with the Minnesota club to have them delay the delivery until January. And in fact, we're shooting for January 20th uh, the, which is a Timpa a star party night. So once we get out there, we'll unload the telescope. We'll be storing it there at the storage facility. And then uh, since it is a Timpa night, I'll be sure to take my telescope, set it up and spend the night to do some stargazing there. So that is the plan for uh, in January 20th is when we expect to have it out there. And if any of you guys would like to go out and help us unload it, because that's going to be a little bit heavy. So. Uh, we're, we'd appreciate the help if anybody wants to have, come out and help. Uh, we've also received a peer uh, to be used for this uh, telescope. Uh, a member uh, who knows John and John, had, John Mead had talked to him about uh, this telescope. He had a peer and he donated it to the club. So we've already received it and we have it out there at the uh, Timpa. Now, some of the work we're gonna have to do when uh, we get this telescope, first thing is we're gonna have to modify the electrical panel. Right now we have uh, two circuit breakers, one for the uh, pads, the member pads, and one for the uh, Gila, uh, Gila Monster telescope. We're going to have to add a third one is, is what we're thinking. Now, Timpa is located out in a floodplain, so if you've been out there, you'll notice that the uh, Timpa 14 does sit about a foot higher than the rest of the ground because it's got the uh, gravel and some dirt to pick it up uh, so it's not sitting flat on the uh, down on the floodplain. And we're also gonna have to build a new enclosure just like the, uh, the little house that we have for the, uh, the Gila monster. Um, of course, we've got the plans for that and for the uh, concrete pads and the, uh, the foundation. So uh, we're, we're working off of proven designs on that. And of course, being a city property and we are sub renters to Tempa, we're gonna have to get approval from Tempa and the city of Tucson, wherever that's required. Now our plan is to uh, build in, uh, the enclosure with TAAA volunteers. And I think we're doing something like that over at the CAC at the Chiricahua Astronomy Center. So we'll be using some of their designs, maybe some of their plans to build the uh, enclosure for this Tempo 16. Uh, we're gonna be looking out for, uh, for looking for bids on a concrete work. Uh, we figured this is something that should be done by people who know how to do some uh, some of the concrete work because it's not just a slab. We're going to have to have a you know the uh, indentations for where the rails run and stuff like that. So we're going to be looking for uh, bids on that. And but the, we have the advantage that a lot some of the uh, T AAA members that are involved in the Gila Monster project are still around. So they've been providing us with a lot of uh, useful information of uh, things to do and more importantly things not to do. So that's been very helpful. So where are we gonna put this? I've showed you this, this before. We're planning to put it over in this area, over close to where the electrical panel is. So it'll minimize how much uh, trenching we're gonna have to do to run the electrical power out there. And it'll be close to the parking area. So uh, uh, we had thought maybe way out here on the right-hand side, but that would be a little bit too far. And so we went out there, there was a five of us on the team and we looked it over and we decided we'll start with right here until we find a good reason not to, but for the plan is to put it out there and it'll be next to the storage container. So any equipment that goes with it will be close by and uh, accessible. 
Now we're going to be relying on funding mostly from our TAAA or TAAA members. You know, primarily the, you know the gravel and the soil for the foundation to build it up, keep it up off uh, higher than the uh, surrounding area. Uh, we're going to have to pay for a licensed electrician, of course, to modify the uh, electrical panel. Has to be done by a city of Tucson codes since it is on city property. Uh, a concrete concrete contractor, we're going to need to uh, to pay for that. Uh, and then the materials for the enclosure itself. And again, we're modeling after the existing enclosure. So we've got plans and everything for that. But now we just got to get the materials and actually build it. Now, our initial estimate, the shot in the dark, we figured eh, about $10,000. But of course, we'll have a better idea when we get bids from all the different, uh, the, the electrician, the concrete contractors, uh, any, any other material. So we're starting with that. And, uh, but we'll get a better idea again as we have uh, uh, bids on the work. Now the donation of the pier and the shipping cost, the $950 that's gonna cost has already been covered by a uh, donation from one of our members. So uh, that's already been taken care of. So at least we've got it here. Now it's just a matter of setting it up. And that's what we got on the Tempo 16. That was our Christmas present this year. So. Um, now I'll turn it over to Ben Bailey and uh, uh, give you some more uh, information on how you can donate to this project. Go ahead, Ben. Hi, Gus. Hi. Um, there you go. So, so like like we said, we're uh, starting. We're just getting started with the, with the fundraising campaign for this project, and I'll be managing. Uh, the donations for it. Um, I've set up an email. So if you're interested in donating to this project, you can send an email here to tempest16donations at tucsonastronomy.org. And I will uh, get back with you and provide the instructions on how to complete the donation since this is going to be a dedicated piece of funding within the TAAA, um, we'll need to set it up so that so that it'll be the the bucket of money will come for this project and we can use it for that. And if you have general questions, you can also call me on my cell phone, which is 520-403-1842, or email me at Mr. Clam at Yahoo.com and I've gone ahead and place those in the chat for the Zoom and uh, kind of got caught off guard and didn't think to have papers printed for the folks that are actually in the room, but I will have, I will send this information out uh, to the T on the, through the TAAA member planet. So everybody will have that. We're really excited about this project um looking forward to getting another telescope out there uh this will be i think we've decided this is going to be pretty much for um viewing and not really set up for astrophotography but again we're awfully excited and obviously donations to the TAAA are tax deductible and always used for a good cause especially in this case Okay, um, so, do we have any questions? I'll leave the slide up. So if you need to take down the information of uh, where to contact Ben, but do we have any questions? Any questions in the room? Raise your hand. No questions in the room. Any questions on Zoom or Facebook? Looks like we missed an opportunity with Dean. There's one question on Zoom if you guys want to check out the chat uh, and answer that. Uh, oh, well, okay. Yeah, Dean Kettleson has just driven from Chicago to here, so he could have gotten it for us. <laughs> Thank you for the offer. But, uh... <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, thanks, Gus and Ben, for all your work on this project. We really appreciate that. All right. Um, great.
Okay, so um, now we have Dr. Mary Turner, who is going to give us her quarterly presentation of what is currently in the sky. And Mary is always entertaining for us and, and has so much knowledge. Really she does her presentation every time she well, does. Well, I don't know. Works Nobody asked that. We are trying to get the slides set up here. So we'll be just a minute. We're having a little negotiation here about getting them to come up. There we go, objects in the sky is up, Mary. And, and then Mary, we have to make sure you have a microphone. Um, you, can, you can use this one if you prefer. Okay, so Mary's getting her mi microphone situated. And we'll be ready to go here very soon. Oh, I understand that and I understand the problem. So, yes, so now we have gender free microphones. Wonderful. We're not sure if people are hearing, so we're checking Mary's mic. Or let me move it out a little bit. Okay, that better? That's way too loud. Okay, hold it. You guys have to hear me. I shouldn't have to hear me. I mean, <laughs> um, and of course, uh, Orion, uh, it's just one of those beautiful things, sights in the sky. That's what I think I like about this time of year, other than we've been awful cloud, cloudy for the last several weeks. But um, there are just so many nice things where you don't even need a telescope to go out and look at. I do want to spend a little time talking about Jupiter, but mostly, and I noticed Eric is here, um, over the last month or so and moving forward over the rest of this quarter, there are a lot of really interesting things. The planets are definitely... Um, aligned properly for observing. So I figured I'd talk a little bit about Jupiter, but just to let you know, there are lots of things to think about if you're trying to look with, through your telescope at, at the planets over the next little bit. Um, talked about Betelgeuse before. Um, I love Betelgeuse. Um, I've added Bellatrix because uh, I had to. Uh, <laughs> 
and then a couple of other stars. And of course, I can't make presentation without at least mentioning a globular cluster here or there because I like globular clusters. And I moved the mouse and can't find it. Okay, so let's start by talking a little bit about constellation and constellation lore. And again, this time, let's talk a little bit about Gemini. And Gemini refers to the twins, in particular, Castor and Pollux, who are actually, as we all know, part of a triplet pair or a set of triplets, whatever you, yeah, a pair of triplets, that doesn't make sense, but they are a set of triplets. Um, uh, this actually comes largely from the Romans. We know that the Romans uh, tended to, you know, the, annihilate the Greeks and others and then steal all their um, heritage. But this one's actually sort of comes from the Romans themselves. Um, Casper and Pollux, going back to the formulation foundations of Rome, uh, but they were the sons of the Queen of Sparta. Um, they were uh, only half brothers. Uh, Castor was actually the son of Leda's husband, um, so he had two mortal parents. Um, Pollux, although he was the twin, um, is the son actually of Jupiter. Um, but they're identical twins. Hey, what, 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 what can I say? As I've said many times, I can't make this stuff up, so it must be true. Uh, and then again, to add a little bit more to this, they are indeed identical twins, but they have a sister. They actually are triplets. Um, and their sister is Helen, as in Helen of Troy um, and the Trojan War, which tells us this must be true because we have proof that the Trojan War was a real event. So if the Trojan War was a real event, <laughs> they, hey, follow me on this, then Helen of Troy must have been real. Therefore, her brothers must have been real. Okay, so I guess this isn't mythology anymore. Some of you don't seem like you're believing me. Okay, um, so, you know, of course, we've got to have, this is a Roman legend, so we've got to add a little bit of blood, guts, and gore. So let's add it in for the Castor and Pollux. Um, they were actually part of the Jason and the Argonauts crew. Uh, went off on the adventures to capture the Golden Fleece. And then after they succeeded at getting the Golden Fleece, they figured, what the heck, let's start up a real business. Let's become cattle rustlers. Yeah, um, Castor did the dirty work. Um, Pollux, the, you know, the demigod, um, just sits and watches things, which was really a dumb way to think about it because... As the demigod, he couldn't be killed and everybody else can. It's like, you get in there and do the dirty work and we'll stand behind you. Um, and of course, things didn't go out very well. Um, you know, just those little types of you know, unwritten agreements. Uh, in the end, you're never going to um, come up with a proper distribution of the ill-gotten gains. And as they all tried to steal all the money from each other, they ended up attempting to kill each other instead. Um, and they were reasonably successful at killing each other. The only problem was Pollux was immortal, so therefore he couldn't be killed. Um, but everybody else died. Um, but then again, they were identical twins, even though they had a sister. Um, and Pollux just, you know, was sort of, really depressed once he lost his brother and he wanted to join him in the underworld um and Zeus actually took pity on him a little bit and he allowed him he allowed uh the mortal son Castor to join Pollux in the sky which actually was a nice gesture on Zeus's part because as we know from the other mythology we've looked at through the years um Jupiter killed enough of the other demigods to really fill up the sky. So actually allowing a space in the sky for a mortal was actually a nice gesture on his part. You know, we've got to give him credit on occasion. Uh, very rare occasions, but we can't. Okay. Um, and another version of the Castor and Pollock story, 
They both fall in love with two sisters. Um, I wonder if they were twins, uh, but those sisters were already betrothed to someone else. Uh, they challenge the rival suitors for the hands of these women. And again, um, we got a mortal in this demigod and a couple of other mortals. We know what the result is going to be. Um, three out of the four don't walk away. Um, okay, you got a twin brother. You love your twin brother and your twin brother loves you, okay? He can't die, you can. Why don't you just send him in? Why, why? I give up. Um, okay, um, now the star caster is within the Milky Way. Uh, Pollux is just outside of the Milky Way. And, you know, the Milky Way, we was sort of the cattle spilling the milk. That's a predominant theme in several of the legends related to some of the constellation type objects. So again, it's just one of those things that we keep hearing or hear several different times. Um, but uh, the early lore on these star, the particular stars go back to the Aryan times. Um, and they were two stars representing the sun and the moon. So the fact that the two bright stars were so closely located with it, to each other were obviously going to be, you know, one of the pointers in the sky that people in early times built their legends about. Uh, the Babylonians also referred to them as the great, great twins, um, going back to Gilgamesh and Enkidu. Um, and I haven't talked about Gilgamesh and Enkidu for in several years now. I might have to go back and revisit that one as well. Um, the Egyptians um, only refer to them as the two stars. Egyptians usually had much more romantic ways of looking at things. Um, and the Greek tradition starts to build on these. Um, but in the, for the Greeks, they were actually Hercules and Apollo. So the, the twins, the Castor and the Pollux, actually did come from the Romans themselves. Um, and, but although the Castor and Pollux comes from the Romans, the fact that you have this bright pair of stars is obviously, you know, just the same as the three, re, the three stars of Orion's belt. It's just one of those things that we're going to see throughout the recordings of astronomical observations. Um, the Chinese elements of yin and yang, uh, symbolizing the light and dark, uh, masculine and feminine, sun and moon, et cetera, also are refer referenced in these stars and sort of make up all of existence. So not overly bloody or gory, it's just demigods don't die. So let's talk a little bit about some of the uh, individual objects that I'd like to talk about. We'll start with Castor, which is Alpha Geminorum, um, even though it's not the brightest. Um, and I do have the RA in deck down there. I'm getting much better at remembering to put that for all the people who ask. Um, oops, went a little too fast. So slide down the glasses and I can actually see the keyboard. Oh, the key doesn't work. It has, I have to act, okay. Um, so it's not just the monitor, Jim. Um, so here's our, we can actually look at Castor. These are, most of the stars we're looking at tonight are actually big enough stars to see. And here's Castor and here's Pollux uh, and some of the other stars, but these are the ones we're talking about. Um, now, when we look at Castor, and we can obviously see it with our with our eyes, that's why it's you know so prominent in the history of astronomy. Um, but we're actually looking at a a complex of stars. Um, it's actually the light of six different stars. Um, the AB star is a pair of A type stars that are orbiting about each other. Around each of those stars is a dwarf star. And south of this pair is YY Geminorum, um, which is also compo composed of 
two dwarf stars. So it is indeed a star system. It's not a simple binary. It is actually a set of six stars. No, you're not going to see them with the naked eye. Okay. Um, it is Alpha Geminorum, but it is the second brightest star in the constellation and the 20th brightest star in the sky. As I mentioned, it is a uh, star system. Um, and it's just that the brightness of stars change over time. Um, and it, at, at, at a period of time, it was, when the buyer designation was put out, it was the brighter of the stars. It's only about 50 light years away. We know it's close by because it's one of the brightest stars in the sky. It's about 10 times as luminous as our sun. Um, the AB pair re revolve around this, their common center of mass about every 400 years. Um, and again, they're all, the individual AB and C stars are also double star systems. Um, separations between all of the pairs is on the order of only millions of miles, which you know, on an astronomical scale is next door. Um, and they have very small orbital periods, nine, three, and one day. So they, again, very close to each other and individually as pairs and very close to each other as the complete system. Okay. Now Pollux, on the other hand, is Beta Geminorum. And here is sort of a scale of looking at uh, things. Here is Arcturus and here is Sirius. And so Pollux is, you know, not quite as big as Arcturus. Okay, nowhere near as big as Arcturus, but significantly larger than Sirius, which is not surprising since it's in its red phase. Okay, its visual brightness is about a 1.2. It's definitely bright. Uh, it is the 17th brightest star in the sky. Again, it's not the alpha star because when they were given the designation, um, it's apparent brightness was different. Um, a few years ago, it looked like uh, Betelgeuse had just totally almost disappeared from the sky. It, it, it changes. Fortunately, Betelgeuse is back. Um, I like Betelgeuse. Um, luminosity uh, is significantly brighter than Pollux. This is 45 times the brightness of our sun at a distance of 35 light years. So it's Bright, much brighter than Pollux, uh, even though it's significantly farther away. So it's, it, it, it's a big guy. Um, diameter is now about nine times that of our sun, but its mass is only about twice the mass of the sun. Again, it's, uh, or you can tell from its orange color that it's exhausted its supply of hydrogen. Temperature is about 4,600 Kelvin. General temp the sun temperature we typically refer to the sun by is 5,600 degrees Kelvin. Um, remember that from my dissertation. Uh, it does have a confirmed exoplanet, um, period of 590 days, so about twice, a little less than twice our year. Mass is about 2.3 Jupiters, but that close to a yellow giant. A, a, not likely to have any neighbors in the vicinity. So let's talk a little bit about M42, the Orion Nebula, uh, one of the beautiful objects to look at in the sky. One of those things that we can see with our, with our naked eye, with binoculars, but with a telescope, it just is absolutely amazing. And even a personal telescope gives you amazing views. I know you gave us a nice web picture. Um, I love those web pictures. We're never going to see those with our telescope. But Orion is one of those things that with a nice telescope, and 16 inch would be really good for that, with, with a nice filter. Um, yeah, it, it's one of the, uh, OK, how many of you wouldn't want to look at Orion Nebula with a 16 inch? Be honest. Okay, come on. Oh, okay, because I have a bigger picture. Huh. Okay, that's weird. But, um, so, the heart, okay, the heart of the nebula. 
Um, the thing about Orion is all of Orion is encased in nebulosity, and I have no idea what was happening there. Um, okay, so what I've done is look bring in on M42 and also looking all around it, where this is these are some of the belt stars where you can see more of the nebulosity. But even if we, certainly if we blow, blow it up a little bit, um, I love sky map, um, we can see even more of the nebulosity that is all around the Orion complex. Okay. So it is, again, uh, something you can see with your eye. Um, it is a region that has a lot of active star formation occurring. Um, it is a gigantic cloud of gas and dust. Linear diameter is about 30 light years. The total nebulosity diameter, if you take it all together, is about 10 degrees or the equivalent of about 200 light years. There's lots of stuff there, and that's probably why we can see it. It's about 1,300 light years away. Uh, inside or it, towards the center is a small cluster that's referred to as the, the trapezium. Um, and some people can readily find four stars. Um, their eyes are better than mine or their glasses aren't quite as bad as mine. Um, but there are six, minimum of six, that can be identified. Um, as I said, when you're looking through the scope, you probably do want to use uh, filters to uh, allow you to get more of the detail through the nebulosity. Uh, but I'm sure since you're all in this room, you've all looked at it and you all agree it's an absolutely beautiful object and we can look at it for the next couple of months. Okay, so uh, again, I am want to talk specifically about Jupiter, but this is largely to remind everyone and Eric, I don't want to steal any of your thunder. I'm just going to talk about Jupiter, but there are lots and lots of uh, planetary interesting things among the planets occurring over the next couple of months. Uh, we started, you know, a couple, few weeks ago when we could see w with Mars, and it's just going to get better. So, but Jupiter, I realize, is a little bit past its prime in terms of viewing right now, but it's going to be nice and bright for a while, even if it's in the West. So, a little bit about Jupiter. Nice thing about always talking about Jupiter is no matter when the last time I talked about Jupiter, it's almost guaranteed there's at least one, I can at least increment the moon count. Um, I'd say over the last, what? Okay, so we're dating ourselves. 10 years or so, it's gone from 50 something to now we're up to about 80. Um, yeah. And yes, some of them aren't necessarily worth calling moons, but technically if it does you know, maintain itself in the gravitational pull of Jupiter and is go to, going around it, it's technically a moon. Um, I'm an engineer, I agree with technical definitions. Uh, so a little bit about Jupiter. Um, diameter at the equator is 142,000, let's call it 143,000 kilometers. Obviously, it's the largest planet within our solar system. And it's on scale, apparently, with lots of the exoplanets that have been discovered because most of them are referred to as Jupiters or super Jupiters or large Jupiters. So we might think Jupiter is large, but there are exoplanets that now, you know, just snicker at the size of Jupiter. Um, mean distance from the sun is 778 million kilometers, so it's a ways away, uh, somewhat elliptical orbit. Uh, its day is about 9.9 .9 hours, so not only is it the largest period, excuse, the largest planet, it also has the shortest orbital period of it, its, its shortest day, um, so it's spinning uh, significantly. It takes about almost 12 years for it to go its path around the sun. Um, it weighs about 300 times as much as the sun, but you could put a 1,300 suns inside of it. Um, Earth's, Earth, you, yep, uh, it's Friday. Um, density is about 1.3. Um, 
So water has a density of one. So it's a little heavier than water, um, but certainly not rocky planet like Earth. That's, that's why I refer to them as these outer planets as gas giants. Gravity is about 23.1 meters per second squared. Uh, we're 9.8. So, you know, you, your weight would be a little bit different there. Uh, mean temperature is a balmy minus 110 degrees C. Uh, don't worry, uh, that's actually going to be a nicer number than what it is in Fahrenheit. So we won't go down there. We won't go down that path. And as of the last time I checked, which was within the last week, um, I now see that we're saying that there are 80 moons uh, around Jupiter. So again, it is the largest of our gas giant planets. Uh, four of the 80 moons are visible with typical amateur telescopes. These are referred to as the Galilean moons. Um, we all know that Ga Galileo found, the, found those moons when he looked at them with his telescope, and he realized that those moons were re re revolving around the planet Jupiter because he could watch their, watch their path, um, and that really didn't go over well with people who thought that, that the, the universe was centered around Earth. Um, I think we all know people who still think that, but I digress. Um, Uh, again, over the last several years, the number of plan, uh, of moons associated with Jupiter has continued to increase, largely because we have better, more powerful telescopes uh, like Subaru, CFHT, Canada, France, Hawaii, out uh, on, in Hawaii, um, and Hubble Pictures and other things as well, allows us to see these things that some of which seriously are only meters across. Um, technically they qualify, however, as a moon. Another interesting thing as is that Jupiter does also have a ring structure, uh, but its rings are not as reflective as Saturn's. So they're not, we don't really, we're not going to really be able to see those certainly with our telescopes. But because Jupiter is so bright, if you're in a dark enough location, it is possible to see shadows caused by Jupiter. Grand Canyon might be one of the few places local around here where we can actually get that effect. Um, notable features are the different climate bands and in particular, the uh, Great Red Spot, which also was a few years ago, almost looked like it was disappearing. Now it's coming back quite a bit. Um, it's a high pressure storm system. You wanna think about it as a hurricane, that works for me. Uh, it's just a hurricane that's three times larger than the Earth. Robert Hooke was the first person who actually documented and recorded it back in 1664. Um, so the storm itself may have lasted for more than 400 years, although there was a period of time in the 1700s, for most of the 1700s into the 1800s, where there really was no real notation of it. So whether or not we're looking at the same great red spot, the same storm, or a new storm that is developed in approximately the same location, up to debate. But fundamentally, we, Jupiter is the, has a weather pattern that produces these long lasting, very, very powerful uh, storms. Uh, again, Jupiter does not have land structure. It doesn't really have physical mass. Um, you know, density is almost like that of water. Um, what it does show variability in terms of wind patterns and pressures, and we see these as color, temp, uh, as color changes and fluctuations in the vi visibility of the structures. And here is a picture of the great red spot. This is from a NASA picture. Um, the cloud layer is about Eight kilometers above the, the the red the the red cloud structure is several kilometers above the local cloud base, which is the the whiter colors, and the period of the swirl is about six days. 
And again, uh, first noted in the 1600s, um, and there's still something very similar there today. Now, people complain about people in Tucson that we know what the weather is every day, never changes. Uh, that's even worse than ours. Um, and here's a picture of the weather structure. And again, with our telescopes, uh, we're not going to see it quite like this, uh, but you can definitely notice the banding structures of the different storm regions. Uh, and the winds are basically uh, 400 kilometers per hour or so. Uh, and those aren't the strongest winds in the solar system. So uh, fun to look at. Little bit on the moons. Uh, the four Galilean moons are the ones we'll be able to show during start parties or look at to, for ourselves. Io is the third largest with a 1.8 day period. Um, it is the most volcanically active object in the solar system simply because it's so close to the gravitational mass of Jupiter. It's getting its innards rung on a daily basis. Europa is the smallest of the Galilean moons, uh, three and a half day period around the planet. Uh, surface is mostly of ice, but there is significant evidence that there is liquid water on Europa. Um, and there are projects underway that look to uh, send craft to Europa to, among other possibilities, look for life. Uh, Ganymede is the largest moon in the solar system. It's actually larger than the planet Mercury. Um, it's large enough to have its own magnetic field. Uh, it has about a seven and a half day period around Jupiter. And Callisto is the last one, the furthest out. So it has a very icy surface. It's very, very cold. It's about a 16 day period. Uh, it is the most cratered object in the solar system. Uh, the gravitational attraction of Jupiter is going to bring lots of stuff towards it, and the furthest out planet is the one that's going to get hit first. Guess you don't want to be the furthest out planet. Okay, and um, these are sort of pictures showing the four, the four Galilean moons, and also here there's this little rock. This is Amalfia it was discovered by Barnard. Um, and like I said, it technically it is a moon. Um, not sure worth talking about. Just, just sort of to show the scale of some of the other moons. Um, so a couple of other objects to talk about. I want to talk first about Bellatrix. Such a pretty star. Um, and Bellatrix, we're going to talk about Betelgeuse and Bellatrix, the two shoulder stars of Orion. So here's Bellatrix right over here. And it is a very large star, not quite as large. Many levels. Uh, Bellatrix does mean female warrior uh, or the Amazon star. Um, please, no Xena jokes. Um, hey. Ever visited Hong Kong? One English language television station. Weekends, you got a rotation. Xena, Sinbad, Hercules, followed by Xena, Sinbad, Hercules, followed by Xena, Sinbad, Hercules. That's when I started to travel with a portable DVD, play, uh, DVD player. Uh, yeah, uh huh. Uh, it's only about 250 light years away. It is the third brightest star in Orion. And I'm hmm, transpose some numbers, but that's all right. But it is the third brightest star in Orion. Um, it is a it has slight variability, but the brightness is on the ballpark of 1.6. I think 1.56, 1.66. Uh, it's blue to a blue-white star. We know that the bluer and the whiter the star is, the brighter it is, the hotter it is, and the shorter its life expectancy. Its mass is about nine times that of the sun. Its diameter is six times that of the sun. Um, and it's 
not minus 211 degrees. Um, it's about 21,700 degrees Kelvin. Um, so that's above absolute zero. So it's not quite as bad as it looks. Because uh, we can knock 473 degrees off of that. Uh, its age is about 25 million years. Uh-huh, only million, and it's rapidly aging. It's probably just a little bit too small to go supernova. That's uh, so, all right, Betelgeuse will take care of that for Orion. Um, but Bellatrix um, has probably a few more million years to go, but Bellatrix is not going to be a long live star in our, in our region of space. Um, so Orion's going to have to have shoulder surgery one of these days. Although Betelgeuse is going to take care of the other one pretty rapidly, too. Um, and Betelgeuse is a huge star. Uh, the thing is that, realize sunspot is an improper word for looking at a star that isn't the sun, but the equivalent of sunspots have been seen on Betelgeuse simply because it's one of those stars that we can actually resolve to that level of detail. And since it's in Orion, Again, zooming out a little bit, we can start to see more and more, some more of the uh, nebulosity associated with the constellation down here towards the nebula. Hmm. Okay. And again, looking a little bit more at uh, Betelgeuse, it, it is, you know, typically we talk about stars as being point sources. And almost any star we're going to look at is a point source, effectively. But Betelgeuse actually does have an angular subtense when seen from Earth. Okay, and there's another view of it. And what, you know, yeah, you can read those. So here is Betelgeuse. This is, this, you can see this, yeah, it shows up much better. Oh, okay. Usually the monitor is much better than the projector, but yeah. So here we can see this is the path of Saturn if the sun were at the center of Betelgeuse. Uh, so Betelgeuse is almost the size of the, out to the orbit of Saturn. Again, it's, uh, it's past its prime. And here's Jupiter, uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. So uh, if Betelgeuse were our sun, we wouldn't be talking about it because we wouldn't be here. Ah, uh, Betelgeuse means armpit of the giant. I'll stick to Betelgeuse. Um, it just has a better ring to it. Um, it's about 650 light years away. Uh, it's temperature, again, red giant. It's cooler than a typical sun, uh, down to about 3,400 degrees Kelvin. Again, our sun, 5,600. Luminosity, a uh, mere 135,000 times that of the sun. Um, it's, it's a red giant. Its age is, again, quite young, um, 10 million years, uh, less than 10 million years. So it's actually younger than Bellatrix. It's just bigger in every other aspect of its uh, existence. Um, diameter is about 950 times that of the sun. Um, and that's the the of the main gas. What we were seeing in that previous picture is the fact that it's already shedding out. Uh, he, you would be able to get some great plasma numbers. If, you're, if, your space if your spacecraft could survive, you would be getting some great numbers from Betelgeuse. Um, and it would have been fun to be there a couple of years ago when, when it did do that ejection. And it, you know, we all mentioned it, that if you looked at Betelgeuse, it just didn't seem to be there. Um, let's see, um, yeah, uh, so visual brightness is about 0.5, uh, historically, uh, it's the eighth brightest, Rigel is usually a bit brighter than, um, than Betelgeuse, uh, currently it's, like said, uh, it's brightness had, has dropped, it's coming back again, um, it may be a single star, 
but we're finding out that most stars aren't single stars. Um, it may be a part of a double star, or there is data that said it might be up to a septuple. Um, don't worry, you've seen the size of it. You're not going to resolve the companions. There'd be spectroscopic indications that, but since we don't really know what's going on as this star is going through its death throes, it's really hard to tell. And if it was a companion that was relatively close, it's probably been consumed by now. Yeah. And again, the neat thing for me to think about, to think about with Betelgeuse is Betelgeuse is a couple of hundred light years away. So we won't know that Betelgeuse has gone supernova until 500 years after it's gone away. So, I mean, it, it, don't worry, Betelgeuse is still there. But it's one of those things to think about. You know, same with Ada Carinae, except that's down there and we never get to see it. Um, we may be looking at things that aren't there anymore. And that, to me, that's just a fascinating concept. But I'm easily amused. Okay, I still, I, when you want me to shut up, just let me know. It, it's okay. I won't take it personally. I'm having fun. <laughs> okay, so now let's move into Canis Major, and let's talk about Epsilon Canis Major or Adhara. Again, here we are, and I'm going to, here's Adhara and Aludra, so we're going to talk about these two little stars down here. That's not overly little, but that's all right. Um, so we can take a look here. Star again, it's uh, it's a bigger star. Um, Adhara in Arabic is first of the maidens. Uh, it's another very young star burning very brightly, so enjoy it while it's here. It's about 22 million years old with a magnitude of about 1.5. Again, very, very bright, about 400 light years uh, 430 light years away. Currently, the temperature is about 22,000 degrees Kelvin, so even a little bit brighter than, warmer than Bellatrix. Diameter is 14 times that of our sun with a luminosity of 40,000 times that of our sun. So there's a lot of power coming from that particular object right now. Most of that, however, is going to be in the ultraviolet region, which we're not going to see with our eyes. Uh, hopefully you have proper filters to prevent your eyes from seeing that type of ultraviolet radiation. It does have a companion that has a magnitude of about 7.5. Um, neat thing about this star is if you step back a little ways in its lifetime, uh, it was 22 million years old. So about 4.7 million years ago, it was about 34 light years from Earth. Um, and its magnitude would have been a minus four. So 4.7 million years ago, Adhara was the brightest object that has ever been able to be seen from Earth. And 4.7 million years, that's a wink of an eye, but see how things change as they move away within the gravitational pull of the other components of universe. Um, so, um, so Aludra is the other star we're going to talk about down here. And we, I mentioned that the first one was the first of the maidens. Aludra just means another one of the maidens. So you're either the first or just one of them. Seems rather discriminatory to me. Um, it is a variable star. It's a uh, an alpha Cygni type variable. So its magnitude varies from about 2.38 to 2.48 over a very regular period of about 4.7 days. So this is, if you're interested in looking at variable stars, this is a good one to start with. Uh, magnitude is about a minus seven with a luminosity more than 100,000 times that of our sun with a mass only about 20 times that of our sun. This is a rather cool star. It's only about 15,000 degrees Kelvin. Um, it's about 56 times the size of the, the sun. Uh, it is a blue supergiant, so it's a real baby. 
um, only about 12 million years old, and it's not going to make it to 20, probably not going to make it to 25 million years. Um, distance is about 1,700 light years away. That's a problem with the nice bright objects we can see in the sky. They typically aren't going to last that long. Okay, so I figure we will end this by talking about globular clusters. Why? Because Mary likes globular clusters, and you gave her a microphone. So NGC 2298. Uh, is it the world's most impressive globular cluster? No, but it's a globular cluster. And didn't want to always talk about the same ones. So here is a picture of the cluster. And oh, so let's go back here. Okay, I thought I had marked the reference point in there. Uh, we're in the re region of Pupus. Okay, uh, it's about 40,000 light years away. Again, uh, globular clusters are out, sort of outside our the Milky Way horizon. Uh, its size is about 10 arc minutes. Like most globulars, it is much older than the stars we've been talking about at about almost 13 billion years old. Magnitude is about 9.8. Uh, you're not going to see this with your naked eye. Um, I don't care what you tell me. Um, it's probably was part of the Candace Major dwarf galaxy system. Um, and it's just floating off on its own now. It is a, one of the smaller globular. It's lost most of its mass. What's interesting about this one is how low its metallicity is. Um, so it be, you know, we, t we talk about starting with hydrogen and then you fuse to helium and then you can get up through the iron and then you, if you want the other stuff, you got to go supernova. Um, so the lower the, metal the metallicity, say that five times fast, um, basically it says things are older because it's not formed from matter from, that was created from a significantly number of supernova because there are no Metal, there is not the metallic content to it. Um, it's definitely lost most of its mass, probably about 85% of the mass that was in that, those stars in the first place is now gone, uh, but it's still very nice to look at. And it still has that diamonds on black velvet approach and everybody likes diamonds on black velvet. So um, thank you very much and I believe I'm done. Okay, questions for Dr. Turner. Do we have Facebook questions or Zoom questions? <laughs> okay. I don't want to know. <laughs> questions in the room? Well, thank you very much, Mary. We really appreciate all of your time and effort on this. It's always an enjoyable presentation. Um, now... I think Dr. Kokoschka is here. Yes, okay. So Dr. Kokoschka, Eric, as you know, uh, does our monthly planet report and he's on the lunar and planetary faculty. So, and Dr. Kokoschka's monthly planet report um, also appears on our website. Okay, a quick update about the planets this month. Our Venus is back in the evening sky, and it's still quite low when you look at sunset. But yeah, every week it will become higher, and this spring it will be very bright, obviously high up in the evening sky. And Saturn is the next planet. It's still above Venus. But on the 22nd, uh, Venus will pass by Saturn, and the distance will be only 0 0.4 degrees. And this makes it the closest pairing of two planets that's visible this year. So you have that on the 22nd. And it, it's not a very equal pair of two planets because Venus is four magnitudes brighter than Saturn. That's, that's really big. But what I, I find interesting is if, if Venus would have a moon like, uh, like the Earth, that's just how it would look. And or if you look from Venus to the Earth, that's that's pretty much how the Earth and the Moon looks. 
So you can remember that when you work on the 22nd. Then Jupiter is really high up, 60 degrees, almost in the south at sunset. And it's nice telescopic objects. And if, if you look at a telescope on the 28th, then you'll see the shadow of the largest moon in the solar system, Ganymede, wandering across. It, it starts at sunset from one side and then ends at 8.30 p.m. on the other side of Jupiter. Uh, the, the two very distant gas giants are also uh, near Jupiter. Uh, Neptune is eight degrees west of it, so it makes it kind of easy to find. And then Uranus is 45, degree, uh, 45 degrees east of Jupiter. That's quite a long distance, but just uh, by the summer, Jupiter will always almost have made it to Uranus. Uh, then we have a, a comet coming up close to the Earth. It's, it's called the comet CGF. It's not, not the biggest comet around, but at the end of the month, it will probably be around fifth magnitude. So um, it will become circumpolar, so you can observe it all night, never will set. And the, the interesting part of it is it will get so close to Earth uh, around the 31st that its motion is six degrees per day, so that's half of the lunar motion. And so if you, you watch it for half a minute or so in the telescope, with respect to the stars nearby, you, you may be able to see how the comet moves and just watching it, which most comets don't make it to such high speed. And then uh, last month we had a, a interesting occultation of Mars by the moon. And I'm not sure if I said that's quite a rare event, but this month we have it again. And so on, on the 30th, uh, the moon will occult Mars and it will be also in the evening, just about the best time. 9.44 PM, it will disappear. And then 10.51, it will reappear. The disappearance will be on the dark limb. So there will be some dark space between the, the moon and Mars. And that may actually make it possible to see naked eye. I tried it, the one in December, naked eye, and, and the full moon just was too bright. To, so I lost Mars before it hit the limb of the moon. But in the telescope, it was pretty. And the same should be here. The disappearance will be at the dark limb. and you may be able to still see it naked eye in a telescope. You'll see the disk of Mars. It's 11 arc seconds diameter, so you might still see interesting detail on, on Mars in your telescope. It will take about 15 seconds to disappear. That's not a long time, but it's, it's nice to watch it compared to less than a tenth of a second for a star. Um, it's interesting to note that Mars transits at 9 p.m., 82 degrees high. And so that will be just about past 9 p.m. So if you observe too long, your neck may not like it. And Mars is north of Aldebaran, and those two stars and planets share almost the same color to the human eye, kind of oranges. And it stays the whole month near Aldebaran because Mars is just near its stationary point. If you want to see any planet in, in the morning sky, you're out of luck, except in the second half of the month, you can see Mercury just very low at the horizon. That's for this month, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Eric. Um, so we want to say goodbye to our Facebook people now. We thank you so much for joining us tonight. And our website is tucsonastronomy.org. So that um, we hope that you will um, contact us and, and follow up with us. And we have meetings the first Friday of, the, of every month. So thank you for joining us. So I think we're at the end of our agenda for tonight.
Um, so thank you all for coming. We're delighted that you're here.